said, well, it shouldn't be, should it? He, and they said, no, it shouldn't. Mr Webb had slipped and fallen in the bathroom, striking his head on the basin. He then lay trapped on the floor, his condition deteriorating. He was just, you know, I was saying, are you asleep? No, 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 I'm not. He was, the word is fading, fading. And then uh, I can only tell you, if you're in that position, you can't wait for the ambulance. In fact, it was a neighbour in his 70s who came first and lifted Mr Webb up and into a chair. The paramedics arrived shortly after, apologised for the delay and checked Mr Webb over. Seacam says it's now investigating why the ambulance was so delayed. Seacam told us the demand placed upon our resources and delays at hospitals waiting to hand over patients means that there are times when we are taking longer than we would like to reach some patients, and in particular, those in a non-life-threatening condition. Last week, we revealed how CCAM is struggling to attract enough staff. It's currently short of 140 paramedics, putting even more strain on the service. The impact on our staff, on my members uh, of Unison, that uh, um, when we haven't got sufficient staff, we need um, our existing staff to work that much harder to try and make up for the shortfall. The Webbs have received a letter from CCAM telling them how to lodge a formal complaint, something they're likely to do, if only to make sure no one else has to wait so long for an ambulance. Malcolm Shaw, ITV News, Rottingdean. Well, CCAM declined to be interviewed about that case. They have apologised to Rupert Webb. In their statement, they blame stretched resources. Now it's a subject that is often seen as taboo, but a charity in Hampshire is determined to bring the conversation about sexual abuse out into the open. As part of a nationwide awareness week, Portsmouth Abuse and Rape Counselling Service have tried to dispel many of the myths that exist. Around 97,000 adults are raped each year in England and Wales, and one in every 14 adults say they were sexually abused as a child. Emma Wilkinson's been hearing some of the human stories behind these statistics. We've changed their voices to protect their identities. There was no one to help, nowhere to go, and physically I was getting more and more disabled, really. This lady was sexually abused as a child. Like many, she suppressed the memories of what happened to her and carried around the secret for years, which took its toll. I kept falling over and I couldn't remember things. And gradually they did all the tests and they saw that it wasn't physical, that it was caused by psychological reasons. But that was quite hard to accept at the time. And it wasn't until later that I realised I'd completely closed down. I went to a psychiatrist once and he said, you might never get better. So now it gives me hope when I come here. She's one of a growing number of people receiving help from Parks, one of the few places that offers counselling and support to survivors of rape, sexual and domestic abuse. The charity has been holding events to raise awareness of a subject often described as the elephant in the room. At this one event in Portsmouth, around 20 people came forward to say they'd been abused. This client started coming to Parks after three decades in an abusive marriage. It was the hardest thing I could do to walk through those doors downstairs because I was actually admitting that I wasn't that confident woman everyone thought I was. I lived under disguise for many years. I wear a wig because I used to self-harm and pull my hair. So the woman who people were seeing was not the woman who was really there. Most survivors of abuse like this never go through the criminal justice process. Of those that have here, less than 10% saw a guilty verdict at the end. But campaigners say that doesn't mean it's rare. All the time we are still getting new clients at parks who may be in middle age and it's still the first time they feel able to talk about these issues. That means it's still an issue out in the community. They feel afraid that if they talk to somebody else, they're going to blurt it, and then the world knows about their secret. Or they don't want their family knowing about it because they just feel embarrassed, ashamed, dirty. But I can tell you, don't feel that way. There are people out there that are willing to help. Emma Wilkinson, ITV News, Portsmouth. And you can find out more about the support available on our website. 
In other news, a 59-year-old pedestrian has died after a collision with a car on the A27 in Lansing this morning. The man died at the scene. A driver of a black BMW was taken to hospital with minor injuries and has since been arrested on suspicion of causing death by careless driving. Motorists faced 20 miles of tailbacks while the road was closed. A man's appeared in court charged with assaulting two police officers in Aldershot. They were attending a domestic incident at a property on Pegasus Avenue when they were attacked and seriously injured. Simon Priest, who's 41, has also been charged with possession of a firearm and theft. It's the end of an era and the start of a new one for cinema goers in Bournemouth. The Odeon on Westover Road, formerly the Regent and the Gaumont, has shown films since 1929. It'll close tonight as a brand new 10 screen Odeon multiplex opens at the multi million pound BH2 development in the town centre. You're watching ITV News here in the Meridian region. Thank you, as always, for choosing us. Coming up. Ten years since its first flight, we take a look back at the life-saving work by Hampshire and the Isle of Wight's air ambulance. For more on all of our stories, do head to itv.com forward slash Meridian. Any views or news, why not give us a call? 0808 1010 095 is the number to ring. Or, of course, you can get in touch via Facebook, or should you prefer, then why not send us a tweet at ITV Meridian. Now, thousands of knives have been handed into police forces across the South in recent years during knife amnesties, where people can dispose of dangerous blades without fear of being prosecuted. But what happens to those knives once they are handed in? Well, these are some of the hundreds surrendered to police during a month-long campaign in Southampton, including machetes and samurai swords. Last summer, more than 50 knives were handed in on the Isle of Wight. A knife amnesty has been underway in Dorset since December. Well, 300 knives handed into Hampshire Police have now gone towards creating a work of art, as Rob Shelley will tell us. 20 feet tall, menacing even in the daylight, this is Knife Angel, part figure, part memorial. Completely made from knives handed over to police forces across Britain, it's taken two years from a sculpture's sketch to a steel reality. I've had to individually bleach every single knife, I've had to blunt every single knife to make sure they're not sharp anymore and can't create any damage. To this must be the strangest material to work with, objects that have had another life. Mm. <sighs> uh, yeah, it, it was all a bit of an idea at first, but the more you got involved with it and got involved with all the families and realised where the knives actually come from, then, then it's, it hits you properly. The knives have come in from every part of Britain. Chances are at least one of the blades in this sculpture was handed in less than five miles from where you are. The dream now is that the angel can take its place on the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square. So essentially, all of those knives there have either threatened somebody, stabbed somebody, hurt somebody, maybe even murdered somebody, but the, those knives there represent what's going on throughout the UK right now. Over the time, we've had families arriving here, we're into the hundreds now, inscribing messages, little sentiments. They're allowed to come in and engrave something to remember their son, daughter. It's rapidly becoming a memorial also to all of those families. Although the body of the angel is shaped from thousands of knives, it's still the smallest fraction of what's been delivered up. Even those amnested from just one city can fill the studio. These blades have come from all over Britain, amnested from Cambridge or Camden or Carnarvon. And you stand next to it, and it's actually quite a malign presence. You start to notice the flick knives and the meat cleavers and every one of them has the story of somewhere where life for someone has gone horribly wrong. From a distance, it's the size that seizes your attention. Close up, you see the angel's skin. Every name inscribed on these blades is a loss, a trauma. All the knife angel needs now is a city ready to reflect her message. Rob Shelley, ITV News. 
Extraordinary. Now, yesterday we reported how 12-year-old Sean Bull had received pioneering proton beam therapy in the United States, treatment that's not yet available in this country. The NHS is sending hundreds of patients overseas, mainly children, because the cancer treatment minimises damage to other parts of the body. Well, tonight Sean is back home in Winchester and is finding out from his doctors if the treatment has been successful. Here's Christine Olsford with a special report report on Sean's journey. For 12-year-old Sean Bull and his parents, it's an anxious waiting game. The family have recently returned from the United States after Sean received pioneering proton beam therapy there for a tumour. At the moment, they have no idea how successful it's been. We don't know if it'll be a cure, but we hope it will have stopped the tumour replicating. So therefore, if the tumour can't replicate, it can't, we hope, grow. Sean was diagnosed 10 years ago. Since then, he's clocked up a huge number of tests and treatments. Can you just show us what you've got in the bag there? Yeah, these are my beads that I've got from every single one of my treatments. Wow. And how many beads have you got? Uh, 1,200. 1,200 beads? Yeah. So 1,200 different treatments that you've received? Mm-hmm. They remind me of my past, that... I've had all the treatments and blood tests and radiation therapy that I've been through. Sean's bead collection grew dramatically when he spent 10 weeks in Oklahoma, paid for by the NHS, as we reported yesterday. After having a mask made to keep him firmly in position, the latest science and technology was used to target his tumour and minimise damage to other parts of his body. There was no other treatment really that was going to, to do anything. Uh, he had uh, six years of chemo in total, I think. What did it mean to you to have this treatment funded? Yeah, it was amazing. Without it, yeah, I don't know what we would have done. Today, the family are receiving the results of the first scan after protons with the doctors at Southampton General Hospital who referred Sean overseas. This is your tumour and that's April. So you can see it's right in the middle of the spinal cord. And now you can see that there's a nice CSF gap here. Mm. What we found the biggest difference is if you sort of measure it side to side this way, you can see it's not that bulging mm. as it was before. So in other words, it is not pressing on your spinal cord anymore. We would say this is a good response. For Sean and his family, it's the news they've been hoping for. We were getting to the stage with the tumour where he was going to, the nerves were going to be squashed and he was going to lose feeling in his hands. And so, yeah, I mean, to, to have all that space in his spine again, yes, brilliant. Actually, it looks really positive, doesn't it? I didn't expect mm. it to be quite as dramatic as no, that. No. Proton beams targeted only at Sean's tumour mean damage to the rest of his body has been reduced compared with more conventional radiotherapies. We've tried to limit damage to normal Sean DNA. That's how I'd like to think about it. And that's really where the key is. We, you know, we're driving a wedge between tumour and normal tissue. I just feel happy that it worked and it's all fine. So was going to America and having all that treatment worth it now? Yeah. Sean will need to be monitored closely for any long-term side effects, but for now, for the first time in a long time, he's free to have fun. It's given us another lifeline. It's given Sean the hope of a really happy, healthy life. How proud of him are you, the way that he's dealt with everything? Immensely proud. Couldn't be prouder, yes. He's a one-off. He's, he's very, very special. Delighted to say that special young man is with us now with his mum, Jenny. Sean, you've been through so much. You look great. How do you feel? I feel much better and back to school and it just feels so much different now. Jenny, how about you? What sort of a journey has it been for you? It's been a long journey, um, but we've had so much positivity all the way through it and uh, we can hopefully see the end of the tunnel now. So uh, hopefully with improvement as we go, as we go forward, yeah. And Sean, you've become a bit of a star locally, is that right, after we first showed your film yesterday? What are your friends saying? Uh, they just kept saying, like, we've, I saw you on TV 
and then everybody just kept crowding me. Happens to us all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I <Joking>. wish. <laughs> Jenny, you were funded by the NHS. How encouraged are you by these new proton beam centres opening up in the UK, hopefully, in the next year, in 2018? It's very encouraging. Um, obviously, we had the opportunity to go to Oklahoma, uh, but we were split up as a family, uh, so all me families can stay together. And actually, it will probably make it more accessible for families as well. Sean, you really wanted to make this film. Tell us why. Uh, so I can inspire all the kids that it's not scary and it, it just goes past really quick. Mm, you have inspired a lot of people. Jenny, briefly, what happens now? So we've got um, Sean's second MRI scan in two weeks' time, uh, where we hope to see yet further shrinkage of that tumour, um, as they expect the protons to be still working for up to a year post-treatment. Love and luck to you both. Are we going to finish with Let's do it. the dab? This is for Sean. Are you ready, Sean? Yep. One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> and for more on Sean's journey and information on proton beam therapy, please do go to our website, itv.com forward slash Meridian. Now, it's 10 years since the first flight by the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Air Ambulance, and in that time it's been called out more than 7,000 times to life-threatening situations. Now the charity is celebrating this milestone by not only extending its service in the air, but also the introduction of a new ground-based operation. Here's Richard Slee with more. The Hampshire and Isle of Wight Air Ambulance is called out on average twice a day, sometimes as many as five times a day in the summer months. And since 2007, it's estimated that thousands of people owe their lives to the quick response from the HEMS team based at Thruxton Airport. We have a fabulous crew of highly specialised trauma doctors and paramedics who are always looking to get themselves and the service better, sharper, quicker and more skilled. This air ambulance now operates in the dark, often being ready to fly until two in the morning, covering not just Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, but also, when necessary, the surrounding counties and the Thames Valley. The service is much improved since the early days, when one of the first patients was Rolf Kitching. He was badly burned in an explosion while working as a welder in Hythe Marina. Rolf now works for the charity. When my family found out I was taken to Odstock, they were very surprised because we live in Gosport, and it was only then they found out the air ambulance existed. And if it didn't exist, you wouldn't be here today? No, that's true. If I wasn't taken to Oddstock by the air ambulance, I wouldn't have survived my injuries. From the initial 999 call, this HEMS team is typically on site, treating a casualty within 20 minutes. That's well within the life-saving golden hour and the critical 30 minutes for the most acute cases. This is important because this means that we're able to get the hospital effectively to the side of the patient, um, giving them a, enhanced clinical care. Uh, we carry a doctor with us and, and uh, extra equipment that we wouldn't normally carry on an ambulance. And thanks to the £6 million raised every year, the charity has now introduced a new ground-based fast response. A critical care team will be based in Eastleigh seven days a week to react to life-threatening incidents where the helicopter is not the best option. Richard Slee, ITV News at Thruxton Airport. Now, if you made a resolution to get fit, you might find your enthusiasm a bit on the slide by now. Well, if so, you're not alone. Next Tuesday, apparently, Valentine's Day, is when most people have given up on their gym routines. We spoke to these gym goers in Fairham. You get obviously at the new people coming on January, and uh, some stay, some go. You thought you could do it, but it's actually like a longer ride than you thought it would be. It's not like a quick fix. It's not just going to like change overnight sort of thing. It's tough, but um, you know it'll start again next year. <laughs> But there's no getting away from it. There are a whole array of diseases we can help avoid if we just take some exercise. So, why do we find it so difficult? Well, the Tonight programme here on ITV at 7.30 this evening has been finding out why. With more, Kevin Ashford. 78-year-old Eric Bagshaw is living proof that exercise can be good for you. He's a regular at this walking football club aimed at the elderly. Doctor came down. He says, "Now then, Eric, what you've been doing this last six months?" So I said, "I've joined the exercise club. This is brilliant. He says, 'Cause what that's done for you is fantastic. Your diabetes is gone. 
your blood pressure's normal, your kidneys, your liver, your heart's perfect. He says, you've got body of a 40-year-old man. That were his exact words. But millions of us aren't doing enough exercise. The resulting poor health is costing the nation an estimated £20 billion a year and causing 37,000 premature deaths. I have recently published a report on baby boomers, people aged from 50 to 70, and the data showed that two-thirds of that group actually had not taken even 30 minutes of physical activity in the preceding month. So clearly, we are woeful on this. Younger generations have become less active too. Three quarters of youngsters, it said, spend less time outside than prison inmates. This school decided to swap its playground monitors for sports coaches to try to improve fitness levels among pupils. It's fun, but sometimes really hard because you have to push yourself to get more bands in. The cheering you on and it encourages you to run faster. There are signs that the authorities recognise action is needed to improve Britain's fitness levels. For instance, the government says it's doubling the sports budget to primary schools later this year, using money raised by the sugar levy. Kevin Ashford, ITV News. Well, let's move on to another very fit guy. They used to call him Squeaky, but could former rugby star Rob Andrew be the saviour of English cricket? Well, the sport faces a lot of challenges, but the ex-England fly half has just started his new role as the chief executive at Sussex, and he told Andrew Pate about his grand plans. Do you need some extra time, mate? Selco, sponsoring ITV Meridian Sports Report. His England teammates used to call him Squeaky because of his squeaky clean image. Becoming a household name with this drop goal, which took England through to the 1995 World Cup semi-finals. But he was unveiled as the Sussex chief executive last year and a month into the job, he's showing a steely determination to bring success to the county. What are your plans for Sussex to entice people here along to the county ground? Well, I think first and foremost, you, you, you've got to do well on the, on the field. You know, people want to see a winning side. That, that's what top end sport is all about. So on paper, we look like we've got a good squad um, and that's classic, you know, it doesn't work on paper. So out there will be the proof, but we want to start winning. Um, and, and obviously attract a younger audience, which we already do to the T20 matches. All eyes are on Sussex, because if he can boost county cricket, the rest of the sporting world will want some of that Rob Andrew magic. Still a close friend of former England captain Will Carling, I asked him how his old teammates had reacted to his new role. Um, it's been mixed, obviously. <laughs> some, it depends whether they like cricket or not. Will's, Will's never been very cultured, so he doesn't, he doesn't particularly like <laughs> cricket. And, you know, I've told him that many a time, but uh, um, cricket's a great sport full of really good people desperately trying to improve um, the state of English cricket. English cricket's not in a bad place, but all sports have challenges um, to, to keep numbers high, to keep their interest in their sport. And he believes having the Kia Super League final at the county ground in September is just one of the ways people will be attracted to home. What part does women's cricket play here at Sussex? Oh, huge. And, and I think the other thing which perhaps people don't fully understand is that from, from here through Sussex cricket, we're sort of an overarching responsibility for all cricket in, in the county. So all the league cricket, all the school cricket and women's cricket, as to be fair, women's sport generally is one of the biggest growth areas um, in, in the country. It's a new sport for Rob Andrew but you wouldn't bet against him being just as successful. Andrew Pate there, and now it's time for Simon. Simon. Uh, you're not exactly cricket weather just at the minute. No. All very dull, very yes. cold. 
So to cheer us up, yes. things that look like other things. Gorgeous. It's been a while. Uh, this time of year, always a treat to find a starling murmuration. Even more of a treat, though. Uh, Brian Terry in Studland spotted one in the shape of a whale. Yes. Look. Oh, that's yes. good. I wonder how many other pictures he took to get that one. Uh, Christine Bickmore oh, stumbled across a cloud shaped like a butterfly, butterfly in the skies above Brighton. And Nick Brazier, this is great, uh, sent in this brilliant photo. He thinks it looks like a house enjoying some broccoli, despite the broccoli shortages, of course, just at the minute. Uh, Paul Crozier... Uh, was in our last cold snap, clearing the ice that had collected in the top cover of his garden it's swing bad. seat. Uh, this was in Reading, in Spencer's Wood, and he thought it looked like a bird. Yeah, yep, yes. absolutely well, bang on the money, or a smile. Yes. And uh, Sue Edwards in East Sussex, something we've never had before, interestingly shaped condensation <laughs> in a conservatory in the shape of a penguin. Well, I can and see And finally, you can always rely on Roy in Basingstoke to find something <laughs> special. That's a snowdrop that seems like us a bit grumpy about the lack of spring-like weather. What would we do without our viewers? Absolutely nothing. Still no sign of snow? Well, you can have a few flurries over the higher ground. A few flurries over the higher ground. Here's the detailed forecast. Simon Parkin. From blizzards to pool, driving through Europe, Eurotunnel the Shuttle sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. Now, you might have noticed that there was a fair bit of gloom around today, but first thing this morning in Dorset, actually not the worst start to the day based on this picture that Steve Hogan took. Then there was a lot of cloud on top of us and it felt cold. And guess what? We've got some showers heading our way as well. Uh, basically around the high pressure to the northeast of us, we're getting that cold wind blowing in the cloud, blowing in the blue splodges here. And they're the bits of dampness that hitting the cold air could well turn wintry over the next couple of days. Nothing too major, nothing that is going to cause too much trouble, but just perhaps a bit of sleet or maybe snow over the higher ground. Certainly the Thames Valley this evening, you might find a little something falling, won't amount to much. And overnight tonight, a lot of the showers staying out towards the coast. But the other blue that's working its way across the map is the frost, because it will be another cold night tonight. Temperatures widely down to freezing and below. So... Might be a bit tricky first thing tomorrow morning. Watch out for ice on untreated surfaces and expect Friday to be another cold one. Again, a few showers drifting in. Again, a hint that they could be a bit wintry, particularly over the higher ground. But very hit and miss. Many of us will stay dry, but it's going to be another cold one. That wind coming straight down from the frozen north. Temperatures 2, 3 degrees. You can make it feel more like freezing in that very raw, cold wind. As for your high tide times, well, you can see in Portsmouth around 20 to 11 in the morning and around 10 past 11 in the evening. And then as we head into the weekend, nothing really changes. Another cold day with a few wintry showers on Saturday. It's not until we move into next week that things turn a bit less cold. Eurotunnel the Shuttle sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. Staying cold. And in just a moment, we've got the ITV Eden News with Mary Nightingale. So Gita Scott, our late news. Make sure you join her, won't you, a little bit later. But for now, from the team here at ITV Meridian, thanks for watching. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye -bye.